Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the March installment of our Tuesdays with Merton webinar. I'm Liz Burkemper, and I serve on the board of directors for the International Thomas Merton Society. Tuesdays with Merton is presented by the International Thomas Merton Society and co-sponsored by the Bernadine Center at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. Join us for this webinar series on the second Tuesday of each month. Tonight's webinar will be recorded and available both on YouTube and as a podcast soon after the live event. The talk will be followed by moderated discussion and Q&A, and our speaker has provided discussion questions on which you can reflect and comment during this time. Or you can ask any questions that you might have of the speaker after the talk. Now, I would like to turn it over to Ann Pearson to deliver our opening prayer. Good evening, all. It's a pleasure to be in such, such excellent company. We'll open tonight with a prayer for the Feast of Thomas Merton from the New Zealand Anglican calendar. Gracious God, you called your monk Thomas Merton to proclaim your justice out of silence and moved him in his contemplative writings to perceive and value Christ at work in the faiths of others. Keep us, like him, steadfast in the knowledge and love of Christ and our community, and let us grow in the sharing of ideas as he did. Amen. Thank you so much, Anne. Now it is my honor to introduce our speaker for the evening, Sophronia Scott. Sophronia is a novelist, essayist, and contemplative thinker whose book, The Seeker and the Monk, Everyday Conversations with Thomas Merton, won the 2021 Thomas Merton Louis Award from the International Thomas Merton Society. She holds a BA in English from Harvard and an MFA in writing from Vermont College of Fine Arts. Sophronia is the founding director of Alma College's MFA in Creative Writing, a low residency graduate program based in Alma, Michigan. Here is Sophronia Scott speaking on Courageous Conversations on Death with Thomas Merton. Sophronia? Thank you, Liz. Um, I don't know why that's ringing like that. <laughs> So thank you for being here. Thank you to the, I'm sorry, there's a sound that I'm trying to get rid of here. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the International Thomas Merton Society for inviting me to this talk this evening. And I also want to thank all of the participants who are on this call right now, because it's not every day that people want to show up for conversations about death. So I applaud you for that and I thank you for that. I'm especially appreciative because, and I will tell you in a moment that the reason for this call uh, or for this topic, oh, but first I'm going to tell you because I don't want anyone to be disappointed. I am not speaking this evening on Thomas Merton's death, how he died, um, any theories about why he died, that's not on the table tonight, I'm sorry. But I am wanting to have a conversation about death, and here's why. Last summer, I was a visitor at the Chautauqua Institute. Uh, if you don't know it, it's an amazing kind of summer camp for adults, not far from uh, Buffalo, New York. And it's a wonderful place. They have all sorts of lectures and you can go week by week every summer and just have a fabulous learning experience. While I was there last summer, I saw on the schedule, it said, um, one of the lectures, it said, Courageous Conversations on Death. And I was excited. I said, oh my gosh, that's, that's great. 
we never get to talk about death, let alone have courageous conversations on death. I'm going to go to that lecture. And I had it circled on my schedule and I was all geared up for it. The day before, I was in another lecture where they were giving announcements and they were talking about the next day's lectures. And they said, and courageous conversations on death. And then they described it. And as it turned out, this really wasn't a conversation about death. It was a conversation about estate planning. And there were lawyers that were going to be there. It was just that kind of talk. And I was so disappointed. I said, okay, but uh, there's no way not going X it off the schedule. But it continued to bother me that I was so disappointed. And I realized that I was disappointed because I really wanted to have this conversation. It's something that's been on my mind for years um, as I'm going through life and losing friends and contemplating my own death. I just wanted to talk about it. As it turns out, it seems to me that when I am looking to have this type of conversation, I usually end up having it with Thomas Merton. Uh, Liz mentioned my book, The Seeker and the Monk, Everyday Conversations with Thomas Merton. And it's really a book where I'm reading through his journals and being in conversation with him with the issues that we have in life. And one of those issues is death. So in my, my disappointment, I once again turned to my fearless companion, Thomas Merton, who has never shied away from contemplating about death, writing about death. He taught it to the novitiates at the monastery. And so I find him a bold conversation partner. So I wanted to share with you some of the things that I wrote in this book, but also other writings from Merton and just thinking about the way we think about death. Now, I will add that we're not going to get to a place by the end of this talk where we will somehow be at ease in talking about death. As a matter of fact, there are many different ways that, that we talk about death that, that we will cover this evening. But I'm hoping that we can just create an opening, a place where we can say, okay, yeah, I, I'm okay with talking about this and somehow loosening something that, that we may be holding on to. So to begin with, this is a quote, uh, one of my favorite Thomas Merton quotes, and you've probably seen it in places, but we'll talk more about it in a moment. Let me read this to you. Death is someone you see very clearly with eyes in the center of your heart. Eyes that see not by reacting to light, but by reacting to a kind of chill from within the marrow of your own life. Now, this quote shows up on refrigerator magnets, um, online compendiums of quotations. Um, these are just some images I plucked from the internet with this one quote. It's available to be plucked out whenever someone wants pithy words about death. It's often tagged as inspirational. My best guess is that people like it because it expresses a cold, clear courage with the calm of a frosty winter sky. It's how someone would want to face death. No fear, no regret, only a cool recognition of the inevitable. Now we'll come back to that word recognition a little later in the talk, but think about that word recognition. But none of these quote mills cite where these words can be found in Merton's writing, and they don't provide crucial context. Merton was writing of a time when he was only 17, gravely sick from a blood infection, and how the death he saw so closely drifting past his bedside was his own. This was before he had faith, when he believed in nothing, Maybe his adolescent self thought dying could be his way of giving the world the middle finger. He wrote, 
And I lay there with nothing in my heart but apathy. There was kind of a pride and spite in it, as if it were life's fault that I had to suffer a little discomfort. And for that, I would show my scorn and hatred of life and die, as if that were a revenge of some sort. If I had to die, what of it? What do I care? Let me die then, and I'm finished. Merton processed death differently because he had lost his parents so young, making his scorn understandable. At 17, he was already an orphan. His father had succumbed to a brain tumor the previous year. His mother had died of stomach cancer when he was only six. He had learned that the bonds tethering us to this world were so fragile, and his mistrust of those bonds energized his devil-may-care attitude. Before he got sick, Merton had spent a school holiday hiking all by himself through Germany's Rhine Valley, reading what he called immoral novels before developing an infection under a toenail that led to his illness. I wouldn't blame Merton if he thought death was stalking him and his family. Only a few years later, his younger brother, John Paul, in his early 20s, would die fighting in World War II. Yet Merton never seemed to reach a point, to reach a point of saying, this is all too much. And this is a photo on the left of his brother, John Paul, and of course, a, a photo of the two of them together as children. John Paul, as I mentioned, died during World War II. And Merton wrote the most beautiful poem about his brother's loss. This is it for my brother, reported Mission in Action, 1943. Sweet brother, if I do not sleep, my eyes are flowers for your tomb. And if I cannot eat my bread, my fast shall live like willows where you died. If in the heat I find no water for my thirst, my thirst shall turn to springs for you, poor traveler. Where in what desolate and smoky country lies your poor body lost and dead? And in what landscape of disaster has your unhappy spirit lost its road? Come, in my labor find a resting place, and in my sorrows lay your head, or rather take my life and blood and buy yourself a better bed. Or take my breath and take my death and buy yourself a better rest. When all the men of war are shot and flags have fallen into dust, your cross and mine shall tell men still, Christ died on each for both of us. For in the wreckage of your April, Christ lies slain, and Christ weeps in the ruins of my spring. The money of whose tears shall fall into your weak and friendless hand and buy you back to your own land. The silence of whose tears shall fall like bells upon your alien tomb. Hear them and come, they call you home. I'm going to repeat that last line. Hear them and come, they call you home. We're going to come back to that because I think there's a certain resonance and thought that Merton has behind that line that I think is quite important when it comes to a conversation about death. So Merton would go through many different ways of thinking about death. But he knew that the conversation was important. And some might say, well, why? Why do we have to talk about it, right? And what do we usually think when, when someone is you know, talking about death and when death happens, right? We, we use that word morbid. Oh, we don't want to talk about that. Um, or we're superstitious. We think it's unlucky to talk about it. But Merton recognized the importance of this conversation. He wrote this in his journal. Never has man's helplessness in the face of death been more potable 
than in this age when he can do everything except escape death. We are always holding death at arm's length, unconsciously, trying to think ourselves out of its presence. And this generates an intolerable tension that makes us all the more quickly its victims. It is he who does not fear death, who is more ready to escape it, and when the time comes, faces it well. Now, as I mentioned before, you know, I don't think we're going to get anywhere near this type of fearlessness that he talks about tonight. But I do hope that we can move toward lessening the tension just with words, just with talking, that we can somehow let go of a little bit of what we're trying to hold back. So in my thinking about putting together this talk, I decided that it would help to, to let's work with a kind of framework of three types of conversations on death. Because I feel like we're always in one of these conversations, if only with ourselves. Now I've ordered them this way, but it's not that one moves toward the next. You don't move from nihilistic to clinging to recognizing. It's more like a range. And we may be any point on that range, depending on time and circumstance. I believe Merton certainly was. And he observed and contemplated these, place, these places whenever he found himself there. So I will discuss the different characteristics of these conversations, offer some words from Merton when he has been in these places, and we'll see where we go from there. So the nihilistic. To me, the nihilistic conversation is the one that he had as a teenager, right? That kind of thumbing your nose at the inevitability of death. You feel like this is all um, a big game and we have a devil may care attitude about it. Um, I had a, an elderly friend who, who was, you know, well known in a certain way. And whenever he, he felt that famous people died in threes, you may have heard that. And he would jokingly, uh, you know, whenever a, a famous person died, he would jokingly wait for two more people to die and then say, okay, he survived the cycle, right? That, and, and we tend to think of it that way, right? There's even um, those um, death games on the internet where you're betting, you know, who might die by the end of the year. It's, it's like a gamer survivor. But what do we get from that kind of conversation? Right? Where's the respect for life in that kind of conversation? Is that a conversation that uplifts us? Is it a conversation that moves us forward? Let's look again at those words that Merton wrote as a teenager. Well, he didn't write them as a teenager, but referencing his teenage brush with death. And I lay there with nothing in my heart but apathy, right? Apathy, he did not care. There was a kind of pride and spite in it. Pride and spite, right? How often um, do you have that sense, right, of being, being indignant that, that one has to die, that we have to die? Right? As if it were life's fault that I had to suffer a little discomfort, and for that I would show my scorn and hatred of life and die, as if that were a revenge of some sort. And if I had to die, what of it? What do I care? Let me die then, and I'm finished. So in, in this respect, we make life something that, that we can toss away. Well, if you're going to take it, I'm going to toss it away. I won't hold on to it. I won't um, consider it worthy, right? It's a game. Maybe I can't win. Maybe the odds are stacked against me, but this is the way I'm going to see it. However, Merton, as he got older, right, recognized that, that that sense would be there for him, that he, he would still have this kind of devil make your attitude, but he was willing to 
not talk himself down from it necessarily, but be in a place of acceptance with it, if only in the moment. So here's this uh, moment, 1962, where he wrote in his journal, I am still too young mentally to be in the least patient of any sign of age. My impatience is felt as an upheaval of resentment, disgust, and depression, right? So, so he, is, um, he is impatient with what is happening to his body, with the changes that are happening. And yet, I am joyful, right? He knows that this is not the place to sit and be in. And yet, I am joyful. I like life. I am happy with it. I have really nothing to complain of, but a little of the chill, a little of the darkness, the sense of void in the midst of myself. And I say to my body, okay, all then, die. Die, you idiot. But it is not really trying to die. It just wants to slow down. Now, when I hear this, I think of death as a kind of tangled paradox. And I will share this, my own personal thoughts about this. I find death becomes a tangled paradox, one I am trying to unravel. Even as I want to enjoy a kind of sweetness, and Merton has described this kind of sweetness, I do feel the sense of being suspended over nothingness. How do I walk in the glow of this life, even as I sense my own death gently approaching? How can I not be discouraged when the loved ones walking with me are lost along the way? The hardest thing about this learning is that so much of it has to be done on the fly. Sometimes it feels like I'm jumping from an airplane and stitching together my parachute on the way down. I know my thinking may be inconsistent, as Merton's has been. It depends for me on what fresh grief has appeared on any given journey. It depends on the turbulence in the air and perhaps even my soul. I'm feeling my way through it, but at the same time, I would like Thomas to model it for me. I want him to help me untie the knots, help me find the grace in this falling. And what do I mean by that? I mean to not be in a place of clinging to life, which is the next conversation, this place of clinging. So avoiding the conversation of death, racing the clock, and maybe this is what our life's busyness is about, that we're somehow racing a clock to think that the end won't come if we're not done, right? We have anxiety over what we can't control. And we often think about this getting our affairs in order conversation, right? Like I said, that was what people wanted to talk about in Chautauqua, the whole you know, estate planning type of thing. Now, I'm not saying that there's no place in this, and I'll actually uh, mention that a little later, but I do feel that there's an aspect of it that, that makes us think that we can still be in control of what we're doing with our lives if we get our affairs in order. Again, that somehow death won't happen if we avoid that. So Merton, well, first of all, let me show you this letter. So he wrote this to a, a woman named Etta Gulet, and he was saying that somehow we need to let go of this clinging, right? Everybody is suffering emptiness. All that is familiar to us is being threatened and taken away. There may be little or nothing left, and we may all have evaporated. Surely one cannot feel comfortable or at ease in such a world. We are under a sentence of death an extinction without remembrance or memorial. And we cling to life and to the present. This causes bitterness and anguish. Christ will cure us of this clinging, and then we will be free and joyful 
even in the night. Now, I think that when Merton got his affairs in order, so to speak, I feel as though this was a way for him to uh, let go of some bitterness and anguish. I think it was a way for him to have a certain level of serenity. So, for example, he talked about how he had friends that were starting to die. Uh, he was well aware of the fact that um, he was in his 50s. Uh, if we think about life and death as a journey, the preparation or the getting one's affairs in order is how we usually think one would begin. So Merton was well aware of the fact that as a man in his 50s, he could drop dead at any time, had been working on preparations for over a year. The loss of college friends prompted his diligence. And he wrote in his journal, I wonder if any of our bunch will live much beyond 60. That September, a friend from his Columbia days, John Slate, died of a heart attack at the age of 54. A Columbia classmate, the noted painter, Ad Reinhardt, had died only two weeks before that. And another friend, Cy Friedgood, would die in January 1968. Merton wrote, I read the news of Slate's death, around, sorry, I read the news of Slate's death around noon and walked up and down in the sun trying to comprehend it. I know too, I must go soon, must get things in order. Making a will is not enough, and getting manuscripts in order is not enough. Now, Merton did manage to get the will done, and he recruited a team of trustees to handle his literary estate and, pub and posthumous publishing life, which is why we have uh, things such as his journals. He, was, he really did an excellent job of getting his, um, his literary estate in order. I wonder if completing these preparations, um, by the way, if you did not know, his papers went to Bellarmine uh, University and the school established the Thomas Merton Center in 1969. Um, but I wonder if these preparations provided some serenity for him. Because a few months later, eight months before his trip to Asia, he became severely ill with the flu and he seemed to endure it with little anxiety. He wrote, an experience like this sickness is purifying and renewing because it reminds you to not be too attached to the narrow view of what you think life is. The immediate task, the business of getting done what you think is important, of enjoying what you want right now. Sickness pulls the rug from under all of it. Haven't been able to do anything think anything. Yet in the evening, the bare trees against the metallic blue of the evening were incredibly beautiful, as suspended in a kind of Buddhist emptiness. Right? His preparations wiped away what we were what what could have been a clinging, right? There's a restfulness there. So is this what we're keeping ourselves from when we have clinging, when we put ourselves in clinging conversations? Uh, Merton spoke of whether or not we are resisting giving up to God when we resist thinking about death. Without the cross of Christ, he wrote, his love of freedom and grace Death grinds down upon the last despairing spark of life and triumphs over it because the spark, still clinging to its own illusion of intermobility, refuses to give itself back to that from which it came. Hence, various religious illustrations of this defeat. For Hinduism and Buddhism, the man who clings to intermobility must in fact go on being born over and over again, since that is what he does in fact want. In the Christian tradition, this interminable, loveless, and meaningless existence is called hell. Now to me, this also describes a kind of scarcity, right? Holding back 
And it goes against what, what I feel is a major teaching of Christ, which is we are meant to have life and have it abundantly and not focus on the loss, not focus on the fact that the spark will go back to where it was created. Now, I find this phrase of the spark, you know, when I read this, it, it sort of lit a, a, a light for me, literally, because I heard something like this before, and I'd heard it in the musical Jane Eyre. There's a lovely song in the musical Jane Eyre where um, it's sung by the character of Helen Burns. And if you know the story of Jane Eyre, um, this is the part in the Jane Eyre story where she lives in an orphanage and she becomes friends with a, a girl named Helen Burns who is sickly and who dies. But right before she dies, she teaches Helen about forgiveness. And there's this beautiful song called Forgiveness that Helen sings. And this line is in it about the spark. The time will come when we will leave this world and then the injustice and the pain and the sin will fall away, will fall away from us. And only the spark of the spirit will remain, returning to God who created it. And then this refrain is, is throughout the whole show. You must never lose faith. You must never lose heart. God will restore your trust. And I know you're afraid. I'm as scared as you are, but willing to be brave, brave enough for love. So I'm fascinated by this, this thought that, that when we resist thinking about death, making it a presence in our lives, that we are somehow resisting a return. This comes up also in other places in literature. Uh, there's a wonderful um, novel by George Saunders called Lincoln and the Bardo. And if you know that novel, it's filled with these characters in a cemetery. And the reason those characters are there is because they have refused to move on after death. They are clinging to something that they feel has been unfinished in their lives. They are clinging to something that, that they think is still coming to them. They are clinging to what they have left undone. And so they, they are in this sort of nether world called the Bardo. Uh, if you know Harry Potter, right? Uh, this doesn't come up in the films, but in the books, you know, the ghosts that you see in Harry Potter, the house ghosts and um, uh, Myrtle, who, who the ghost in the bathroom. So when Harry in the fifth book, um, Harry, after his um, godfather dies, he goes looking for him thinking that he can speak to him in the same way that these ghosts exist. But one of the ghosts tells him, well, no, Harry, that's not how it works. We are here because we weren't brave enough to move on. You know, they essentially tell him that. And not everyone chooses to stay. So I, I'm fascinated by that, this, this thinking of what it means to move on and how do we put ourselves in a place of letting go. Merton uh, also wrote of um, this spark, like this same sort of feeling about um, the injustice and the pain and the sin will fall away from us. Um, he had this quote, at the center of our being is a point of nothingness, which is untouched by sin and by illusion, a point of pure truth, a point or spark, again, which belongs entirely to God, which is never at our disposal, from which God disposes of our lives, which is inaccessible to the fantasies of our own mind or the brutalities of our own will. He also wrote, death is the point at which life, by freely and totally giving itself, enters into this ground and this infinite act of love. Death is the point at which life can, if we so choose, become perfectly real, not because it demands to be interminable, but because it can receive the gift of pure actuality and the love of God. Death is, then, the point at which life can attain its pure fulfillment. Death brings life to its goal, but the goal is not death. 
the goal is perfect life. So not clinging, but release, giving, an active life in the present moment of living this gift that has been given to us. So how can these words reshape not only how we think about death, but also how we think about living? So that doesn't necessarily mean that we come to a point of not clinging, but we do come perhaps to a recognition. And you know, maybe the recognition comes first and then we stop clinging, or maybe the clinging, the recognition helps us stop clinging. But I do feel we get to this point of recognition, not about the inevitability of death, but perhaps the, that we recognize where we're going and that there's nothing to fear because we we know what it is, right? that we somehow have this inner compass pointing the way. And if we live our lives in a certain way, in the present moment, that somehow it will come close to us and we will sense it, right? That sense of home that Merton mentions in the poem. He writes, death is always a possibility for everyone. We live in the presence of this possibility. So I have a habitual awareness that I may die and that if this is God's will, then I am glad. Go ye forth to meet him. And in the light of this, I realize the futility of my cares and preoccupations. Now, not futility in a way that would make him want to give them up, right? Because some of this he's talking about writing and he talks about, you know, some of his, um, uh, his arrogance and his, you know, attachment to his work. But I think he means futility that taught him how to hold things lightly with a kind of detachment. The autumn quality of detachment that comes from the sense that we are coming to the end of our lives but this sense of being suspended over nothingness and yet in life of being a fragile thing, a flame that may blow out and yet burns brightly, add an inexpressible sweetness to the gift of life. For one sees it entirely and purely as a gift and one, and one which one must treasure in great fidelity with a truly pure heart. What does it mean for you to treasure your own life. And I'm asking you this, and I'm thinking about this myself. What does it mean for you to treasure your own life, to see it entirely and purely as a gift? Even one that, that as it must be given back, right? The day may come when we will have to pass through death with our body. But at that time, if we have trusted God and believed him and sought to understand his ways with us, we will pass into a new life which we do not understand and which we can only accept from him as a secret gift of his love. Now, Merton doesn't describe heaven in the traditional sense, but in this, he seems to describe a faith that grounds him in the present moment with a powerful focus on life now and an acceptance of whatever may come after, right? An acceptance of whatever may come after. And I think about, you know, what do I need to feed the trust that Merton speaks of? What do you need to feed this kind of trust? You know, even if you don't have a sense of God, but have a sense of something familiar that's going to come after. I believe, you know, th there's nothing futile about our existence. We are not alone. Indeed, we are supported by, by a greater sense of this life in this endeavor of living. Even as the losses mount, even as we lose loved ones, even as the temptation to become bitter rises. If we trust, 
if we pray, if we meditate, it's possible that we may recognize, even receive a glimpse of an image that's representative of the home that Merton mentions in that, in that poem, the home that we are going to. So Merton, in Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander, seemed to have this notion, right? He had this notion that he may soon die, and he had this ethereal dream that he describes. He said, I was lost in a great city and was walking toward the center without quite knowing where I was going. Suddenly, I came to a dead end, but on a height, looking at a great bay, an arm of the harbor. And he talks about how, even though he wasn't familiar with exactly what city this was, somehow he knew it, and that the arms of the harbor allowed him to know where he was. Now, while he was in Asia, Merton indulged in his love of photography shooting images that would eventually illustrate his Asian journal using a camera loaned to him by his friend, the writer and photographer, John Howard Griffin. Merton would send Griffin his rolls of film and Griffin would develop them and provide Merton with contact sheets and notes on what he thought were the best shots. After Merton died, Griffin, upon learning the camera would be returned to him, guessed that it might contain photographs. He wrote a letter to the powers that be, begging them not to open the camera when it went through customs. It turned out he had guessed right. More carefully than I've ever done in my life, I removed that roll of film, writes Griffin. There were 18 images on the roll of film, and Griffin describes the first photograph that he chose to enlarge. It showed a harbor lined with boats, the water shimmering with light, I looked through Merton's eyes on a scene viewed from some high place, downward past the edge of a building and a foreground of shore across a broad body of water from which reflected sunlight glinted back into the viewer's eyes. A universal, all-embracing view of men and boats and water seen from the perspective of height and distance. Only later did Griffin realize this image of the Bangkok River was an exact depiction of the dream Merton had written about years before. I find comfort in this story, in the fact that Thomas dreamed years earlier of the place that would hold his vision right before his death. For as much as we seek our paths and have questions about the journey, I believe that there is a sense deep within us, like a primeval compass that shows we already know where to go. We only have to recognize the place, live our lives trusting that it is there and believe when the time comes to float toward the harbor and that all shall be well. So when I talk about courageous conversations with death, about death, there was one that I had, and only one, and I had it with my mother before, um, and this was actually a couple of years before she died, and I did not expect to be in this conversation, but I was visiting her in the nursing home one night, and she said to me, actually, um, this was um, during the day, because it was right before her lunch, she said to me, Sophronia, I'm dying. Her voice, however, didn't sound like the voice of a dying woman. It was strong and clear, clearer than I'd heard it in ages because of her persistent, phlegmy cough. I sat on the side of the bed, leaned toward her, and looked into her face. She didn't seem distressed or sad, but I saw, as I often do, the same cloudy look of concern, like there's something she had to do but couldn't quite remember what. How do you know, Mom? I asked. She shrugged and tugged at the little blue turban she likes to wear over her thin thinning hair when she's not wearing a wig. I just know. I feel like I'm running down. 
I don't know how to let go though. For years, I'd spoken to my mother in the same tones I would use to humor a child. She never wanted to, to, she never seemed to want more from me even before the dementia. I always felt she stopped listening if I went deeper into anything beyond the news. But in that moment, perhaps for the first time ever, I spoke to my mother as I would another adult. It's going to be okay, I said. I spoke slowly and enunciated carefully. I wanted her to know her brilliance in this particular area. I wanted to remind her of her power. You already know this. You know it better than anyone. When the time comes, you'll know what to do and you won't be alone. My son once asked me, could Grandma Ruby ever forget God? I told him no, that even if she didn't have the word, she would have the feeling. I looked into my mother's eyes and hoped my words would trigger that feeling, if that was indeed what she needed. She rubbed her hands together and nodded. A nursing home aide brought in the tray and plastic dishes containing her dinner. Mom gestured at the food. God is great, she said. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. I pulled the table closer to her chair and sighed. Amen. And I'm going to leave you with this one question. But first, this quote that Thomas Merton wrote in his journal in 1952, which I believe is a similar very beautiful sense of what it could be when we step into that place of recognition. Now my whole being breathes the wind that blows through the belfry and my hand is on the door through which I see the heavens. The door swings out upon a vast sea of darkness and of prayer. Will it come like this, the moment of my death? Will you open a door upon the great forest and set my foot upon a ladder under the moon? and take me out among the stars. And my last question for you to think about, what might your image be? The image that Merton saw, that he recognized, that could be the place where he was going. Do you have a sense of that image, of what it could be? And maybe it's been a fleeting thought in your mind, and maybe now you realize, ah, that's what it is. And if you have that image, may it be your comfort as we continue these conversations and as we look for ways to treasure our life, even as we hold our death lightly in front of us. Thank you. Everyone, please join me in thanking Sophronia for the talk that she's offered us tonight and for the conversation that she brought to us after she wished it happened at Chautauqua. And with that, I would now like to turn it over to Ann Pearson, who is our moderator for the evening for discussion and Q&A. Thank you so much, Sophronia. It's absolutely brilliant and so much to think about. And as we continue this courageous conversation this evening, there's a couple of ways that you can engage. If you have thoughts that you'd like to speak aloud, you're welcome to use the raise your hand feature on Zoom and we will cede the space to you. You're also welcome to put your comments in the chat. And Paul Pearson has actually dropped something already and said, towards the end of the Seven Story Mountain, Merton refers to, quote, the grim smile of satisfaction that Trappist corpses have, end quote. He says, I think that monks, especially Trappists, have a different attitude to death than society as a whole. And so, Fernie, I was wondering if you could reflect a bit on, I guess, how Merton's space at Gethsemane, both as a Trappist at the Abbey, but also in the Hermitage in nature, how that helped him to process and move through these different phases and different conversations about death, especially because you mentioned... Yeah with his friend's death, like he spent time in the sun, what that looks like for him and what that looks like for us. Yes, so um, the, I don't know if the article that Paul is mentioning um, talks about this, but the Trappists had this uh, 
this, uh, I don't know if you would call it a habit or a tradition, but when they would learn of someone's death, right, the response would be, Alleluia, right, Alleluia, you know, the person has, has gone on. And I think that the, the practice of prayer and of thinking about death and knowing that it is a going, right, not necessarily a loss, um, helped him process that. And I will add that when I learned of, of my mother's death, when she eventually died, uh, that, that had been a similar feeling. I didn't say hallelujah, but I said, yeah, mom, you did it. Yeah, you go, mom. <laughs> right. So, um, so I think that, that those practices helped him because it, it's, it's um, his experience. If you think about it, even though he was in a monastery, it's not that different from our own. Because, you know, we go to church, we pray, we think about um, even now in Lent, right, the darkness of Lent, and we think about the joy of resurrection. But still, when those deaths come, when the bad news comes, right, we still are hit hard by it, and we still carry grief, and we still have to somehow come out of it every single time to, to find a new way of looking at the world. And I think Merton... Um, what I like about him is that he didn't hide those cycle, those cycles, right? He didn't just say prayer, 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 and, and it's going to be okay. He, he, you know, grieved his death, the deaths, right? He sat with them, right? And he knew that that grief was real. He didn't deny it. It seems like he recognized that grief was just a part of the cycle of processing yeah. death, which is... It's yeah. certainly something to take to heart. Yeah. Um, Mark shared in the chat, we do need to talk to each other more about death and dying and our serious struggles because we are a community that offers support. Um, I guess, have you found that sense in your own life that the communities that you're within, including the one that you're in with Merton, allows you to process more easily? Well, I think it's in, when I think about my... Um, childhood because I, I think it, it starts with the family right and I do recall being taken to funerals as a child and I recognize the importance of, of my son even though um, he experienced tremendous loss our whole community did um, because of the Sandy Hook shootings he lived that process even though he was only eight years old having lost a close friend, right? Um, I knew not to hide any of the process from him, to take him to the funeral, to have him be in the spaces where others were grieving, to allow him to express what he needed in that grief, right? Um, and to take him to um, a loved one's deathbed, right? Even though he was, he was you know, still very young, to take him to see his grandmother before he's dying, for him to to walk through these, you know, as a family, right? I think that helps, right? And, it, and it's not like it makes death something like, oh, you know, um, just like lackadais like a lackadaisic, oh yeah, I've been there, done that. No, I think it gives him an appreciation of, of life and a certain respect for it, right? That um, he doesn't have to, to fear a darkness, so to speak. I think you mentioned that in your book as well that there's a sense that even when your friends people who you've lost who you love very much are gone that that's a way to reflect and allow growth and love to continue through that yes yeah um because he he feels that that he has had a sense of his friend who died at Sandy Hook that, that he still has a sense of him being around that he is everywhere and yeah, I think you're also referring to the story I tell in the book where um, after he and I have that conversation, we're, we have that conversation and I say to him, you know, we talk about the people, the loved ones who are around us, who um, that they must be around. But I said to him specifically at that table, we were in a restaurant. I said, but you know, I don't think Aunt Theo is around, my sister, my, my sister who died about 10 years ago now. I said, you know, she was a very mischievous person. I said, I just feel like she has other fish to fry. She's not around messing with me, but I'm small. I'm small potatoes to Theo. And I said that. So that was on a Wednesday. On Saturday, I think it was, 
I get a note from my brother's oldest son, who is in his own basement, going through a bookshelf, looking for something to read. He happens to pull off the shelf the book that I gave to my sister right before she died. And he took pictures of the pages but, and saw that I had inscribed it to her, but also that she took notes in the book, showing that she had read it. For some reason, he felt moved to take pictures of these pages and he texted them to me with the note, Aunt Theo wants you to know she loves you. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> okay, leave it to Theo to, to prove me wrong, <laughs> right? So I can't explain something like that, right? So how can we not have this sense that, yeah, there's something, there's something. Uh, and in the chat as well, Francis reflected, uh, we're talking about some of the quotes that you shared, that the word chill occurred in two of yeah. them. Does that mean that we know it when we see our vision of death? I don't know. You know, I thought that too. It's interesting that that he uses that word chill, right? Um, because we, we use that in general, right? Like goosebumps, like, oh, I just got a chill, right? And I don't think he means it in a negative way, like death is, is cold, but there is something right of of intuition in our very selves right something that we need to to pay attention to um and and francis it may not be like a like a vision of us dying but like i said something like a place i feel like it's a place and i describe that in a book but that that i often dream of a very specific looking place i know that i've never been to and yet it's weirdly familiar to me Right, so I don't know. I I just think it's worth it to pay attention when those feelings arise, when that chill is there. And Mary in the chat as well shared that she faced death as a child, and that the reoccurrence of that illness at twenty six, that kind of facing death so early, made her want to live life to the fullest. Um, which I think is something that's kind of a common trend, especially among children nowadays, when we talk about shootings and things like that. It's sort of part of our society now. Uh, Paul, if you want to ask a question, feel free to go ahead. Yeah. Yes, um, Sophronia, I, and I don't want to take this conversation in a totally different direction because I know you want us to engage with uh, the idea of death. But um, in listening to your quotations from Merton, and some of the other things you said, I hear echoes of St. Benedict, of Benedict's rule, keep death ever before you, et cetera. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think, I think that the monastic formation is certainly a part of Merton's um, engagement with death. In your working through this, did you see other particular influences in the way his outlook was shaped? Oh, definitely, you know, Buddhist, right? Buddhist influences and teachings, right? Especially um, when it comes to the um, the word detachment that we have in one of the quotes. So I, I feel, Paul, as though he, he experienced so much death first, right? He was already, you know, very young. And like I said, before he had beliefs, but I think coming into the world of faith gave him a way to process it, right? Not just influence, but, but a way to process it. Um, you know, he'd also, he'd also um, had been through, um, you know, going into the monastery, right? Thinking in terms of a kind of death, right? Thinking that, for example, that he had left behind Thomas Merton Right, and and even thinking that 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 Thomas Merton somehow has to die, right, for for Father Louis to be, and he never quite got to that point, but just to understand that death, that 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 there is a kind of life in death, and but what I find interesting, Paul, is that he doesn't seem to, while keeping death before you he doesn't seem to go all the way over into this thinking that um, that death, how do, how do I put this? He doesn't go all the way over into to 
just thinking it's about heaven and hell, right? That that there is a sense somehow of resurrection, where uh, whatever that may be, and he doesn't put out that 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 there is one or the other, but holding this unknowing, right? He he uses that word trust quite a bit, not knowing what comes next, but this trust that it will be whatever it will be, and and that's not quite um, that, that's, to me that's sort of unusual in terms of of Christian teaching, right? Because that, that sense of heaven is out there. Um, and, you know, that, that whole image of, of, you know, being with your loved ones again and, and all of that, you know, um, and I'm not saying that that's wrong, but I'm just saying it's, it's interesting that, that he doesn't put that forward, right? But, you know, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Thank you so much. We have time for maybe one or two more questions or comments. Does anybody have anything on their mind that they would like to share? I'm reading Richard's uh, comment. Mm -hmm. And Judith, if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, I just, uh, to kind of follow up on what Sophroni was just saying, you know, I felt those quotes by Merton and a lot of what you said, Sophronia, were, a, were about death, but they were also about life, about yeah. how do we want to live our lives. And I believe uh, there's a passage that's coming back to me from either um, uh, conjectures or sign of Jonas, probably conjectures where Merton quotes Rumi, Rumi saying, you know, death is an enemy to those who consider death an enemy and a friend to those who <laughs> consider death a friend. Yeah. And I think that kind of sums up a bit of where he was at um, toward the end of his life. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, a wonderful scene in um, the movie, The Hours, right, which depicts Virginia Woolf working on Mrs. Dalloway. And she comes to this realization that one of the characters has to die. And her husband asked her why, you know, why does someone have to die? And she says, so that everyone else can understand the importance of being alive, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, <laughs> you know, and, but somehow Judith, we, we somehow have mixed it up so that life, that, that we think living and appreciating life means that we somehow have to ignore death, that we can't hold it both at the same time, right? Um, negative capability, as, as John Keats would put it, right? But, but, but we can hold these two things, these two opposing things at once, right? And, and one does not have to lessen because we fear the other, right? If anything, it's, a, it's about being brave in, in this existence and in, in this time that we have and being willing to release the spark when the time comes. Thank you so much. I think with that, we'll go ahead and close out the conversation portion of this evening, but we encourage you to continue to think and reflect on Merton's role and his way that he can guide us in our conversations about death and about living. With that, I'll pass it back to Liz to close us out tonight. Thanks, Anne. Please join me in thanking Sophronia again for sharing her thoughts and collecting all of those special lines from Merton for us. I would also like to thank Ann Pearson for offering tonight's opening prayer as well as moderating discussion and Q&A. And finally, thank you so much to Christine Pinkowski who has been providing technical support behind the scenes for tonight's webinar. If you would like to access this recording or others, you can find the links to all Tuesdays with Merton webinars at merton.org slash ITMS. Registration is now open for next month's webinar when author and publisher Robert Ellsberg will speak to us on, it's the direction that matters how Sister Wendy Beckett changed her mind about Merton. 
If you would like to learn more about the work of our co-sponsor, the Bernadine Center at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, please visit ctu.edu slash academics slash Bernadine dash center. If you would like to become a member of the International Thomas Merton Society and receive the Merton Seasonal Magazine, as well as updates on our upcoming programs and conferences and information on new books published about Thomas Merton, you can join us as a member online at merton.org. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and continuing to spread the word about Tuesdays with Merton. Take care, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you again next month.